Hello and welcome to Noble Mind. Noble Mind is a podcast exploring mindfulness, meditation, and psychology. Hello, listeners. In this episode, we chatted with Alfie Wishart about addiction recovery, compassion, shame, and the role of spirituality in healing. He explains codependency, the true self, false self dichotomy, and how he helps people heal from narcissistic relationships. Alfie is a therapist in private practice in Dallas, Texas, a longtime meditator, a licensed professional counselor, licensed chemical dependency counselor, and a certified rehabilitation counselor. He's also a trained teacher in mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindful self-compassion, and a member of the International Mindfulness Teachers Association. If you're a fan of Noble Mind, we'd love for you to follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, or Twitter. And come join our free Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash noblemind. And as always, you can learn about upcoming events, get our show notes, and join our email list at noblemindpodcast.com. Enjoy the show. We are here with Alfie Wishart. Thanks so much for joining us on Noble Mind today. You're welcome. <laughs> Glad to be here. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Uh, love to hear a little bit. Maybe introduce yourselves to our audience. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Sure. I uh, live in Dallas, Texas. I'm in private practice in counseling, psychotherapy, and teach uh, mindfulness MBSR courses and mindful self-compassion courses. It was only fairly recently that I learned about mindful self-compassion, MBSR. I started meditating a long time ago. But what started the process, my parent, both my parents were union organizers back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so our family life was really focused on, hey, this ain't right. We got to fix it on that basis, which really is the definition of compassion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that we talked about that all the time. It was dinner time talk and things we uh, discussed on a regular basis. And uh, as I grew up, though, I realized that I had the same kind of problem my grandfather and my father had with alcohol and, and drugs and lots of crazy stuff. So this sort of combination of caring for others and not caring for oneself is a theme that was going to play out in various ways later on. So I... Uh, Went to school and got married and hung out and went to Woodstock and did all the hippie things and all that sort of stuff. And, Do you have and, some photos? Uh, I think there's a longer no. story there, but good. <laughs> <laughs> that is another story. That would be fun to talk about. But anyway, I got to Austin and I had reached sort of the end of the line on my drinking. I had been drinking around the clock for about two or three years. And because I didn't like being sober. I do not like it. Makes sense. So, so anyway, I had this sort of spiritual experience in Austin. I was living, we were living in Austin at the time, and I got a very clear message that if I didn't stop drinking, taking drugs, I would die in the gutter. And I thought, I don't want to do that. So it's like everything took a 180 degree turn. And I started working in an herb store, herbs, et cetera, in Austin. People who've been there a while remember herbs was that on a dime on a on a dime turning on a dime um yeah or maybe that was a penny (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um but i loved it and it was the only place to go in the city at the time if somebody wanted medical care or some wellness help uh there wasn't a physician so people came in with all kinds of issues and um, i learned a tremendous amount I learned a lot about herbs and I got intensely interested in spiritual practices. Are you saying herbs like herbalism, that kind of thing? Like a holistic healing? Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. We had 300 and some different types of medicinal and Uh herbs and spices Uh and it was wonderful. We made our own formulas and tinctures and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I also got really intensely interested in uh, spiritual matters because we also had a bulletin board and there weren't that many bulletin boards that had these kind of things, right? So anybody who was doing something spiritually based, we got a notice. And so I went to the mall. I mean, I didn't, uh-huh. I didn't care what it was. So I was hanging out with like 
esoteric Christians and Sikh Dharma folks and New Age folks and Buddhists and Sufis. And it was just a really wonderful time. I started working with the Sufis and actually started a spiritual development phase that was really intensely, uh, it was really intense. And it really helped me clear up a lot of stuff. I learned how to meditate and I had to do all these practices. And, and so things were going really well, really, really nicely. And then I met her. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Next she, chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she had this, she was driving this old like 50s car and she bopped out of this car in full length mink, oh, antique mink coat. I thought, this is really interesting. So anyway, long story short, she and I got together and eventually got married and, and had, uh, have had, we've had two girls, two, mm-hmm. we have two daughters. Mm-hmm. And, but it was a very rough ride. Back in Austin, I was told that, you know, Diana Getter said, if you stop doing and taking drugs, it'd be very painful for 10 or 15 years, mm-hmm. but don't worry, you'll lead a good life, mm-hmm. you know? And I thought, okay, well, here's a very painful 10 or 15 years. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. But what I realized from all that, number one is the power of forgiveness, because, our, you know, our relationship is really tumultuous. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. I was only like two years sober without any recovery. So I went from being alcoholic to very codependent, trying to make everything right. And it was all my fault, you know, that sort of thing. And we divorced, and I just got to the point where I said, I just can't take it anymore. You know, this is too much. By that time, I had a concept of God and spirituality and stuff, and it was external. But I said, okay, you take it. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Through a series of unusual coincidences over the next several months, I landed in a recovery program. I thought, what am I doing here? You know, it's like, but I knew I had no other option. That was very clear. So I went and slowly things began to get better. And a lot of people don't understand that alcoholism is has less to do with alcohol than the dynamics of alcoholism. Uh, It's referred to quite clearly in recovery programs, but it's not well understood outside of recovery programs. A lot of people miss the idea that in the early days, alcoholism was referred to as a spiritual malady. And since I hadn't been drinking in a long time, that was really what I had to work on. So much of my recovery had to do with developing right relationships with my kids, right relationships with my ex-wife, uh, dealing with all the stuff that happened in my family, because there's a lot of stuff that happened internally in the family that wasn't good. I had to deal with all that until I get my feet on the ground, because at that point, my spirituality is up in the clouds somewhere, and I didn't really know how to apply it. So sort of disconnected from the everyday application. And- mm-hmm. Exactly. Well, like if somebody says, you know, you need to surrender, I'm going like, what? <laughs> what is that I don't, right I don't right what does you that know, look got, like yeah and, I, and i've got to forgive them what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> and i did a lot of volunteer work at uh, salvation army and hospitals and stuff like that but at one point i really wasn't happy i had been doing some business consulting and everything just kind of folded at once and i didn't know what to do so i asked a simple question how can i best be of service because I didn't know. And literally 10 days later, I was working at a treatment facility for drugs and alcohol. It was a residential facility. And it was a long-term facility for people who had bombed out of five, six, seven, eight other treatment centers. So it was for really low bond, very difficult cases. I started working there and then I got the nudge to go to graduate school. So I went to graduate school and did two years doing that. And so the mixture of concern for others that I'd gotten from my parents really was localized to the problem that my parents never were able to address, which is alcoholism. That was inherent in me. My grandfather was a terrible alcoholic. My father was better, but he had his issues. And so I'm working with others and working with people in a recovery situation where spirituality was the basis. I'm going, maybe there's a connection here. In school, I um, ran into some 
uh, very difficult times, which I found later was really there was a particular professor who was not well, and I didn't really understand what was going on. It was a very difficult time. It took three years instead of two for me to get out of uh, school. And I worked, when I got out, I worked at a treatment facility that was for people off the street. I mean, their admissions office was 7 a.m. in the morning, and you had to be there and stand in line. And if you got a bed, you got a bed, and if you didn't, you didn't. Because one of the things that I was really curious about is there is a lot of discussion about dual diagnosis, where if somebody has a mental health issue and they also have an addiction issue, how do you treat that? So I wanted to work with people who had clearly no addiction issues and clearly had mental health issues and vice versa. So I did that and I worked in a couple of hospitals, which I really loved doing and um, IOPs and things like that. So I had a pretty good, clear idea of the difference between a mental health issue and, a, and how to treat that. And if someone also has addiction, addiction how, to, how to treat that. So anyway, long story short, I did a lot of time working in institutions and IOPs and stuff, and I morphed into where I am, private practice. And along the way, I developed a really strong spiritual practice, a clear meditation practice and teachings, and uh, took refuge in 89, Tibetan Buddhism, was the benefit of a number of really fine teachers. But I didn't know how to integrate all this, right? I'm over here, I'm doing this dharma practice and over here i'm practicing psychology and i know the two go together and i wasn't quite sure how and then also a lot of people may not know that prayer and meditation is a core practice in recovery prayer and meditation prayer and meditation is a core part of the recovery process so i felt like i had all the elements i wasn't quite sure how to put it all together so eventually i ran into mbsr Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is a program most people know by now that it was John Kabat-Zinn created in 1979, University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School, and then Mindful Self-Compassion, created by Chris Garmin, Chris and Nev. And I thought, well, this is a really good idea because it operationalizes it. MBSR has tons of research on it, and it's helped to transform the field of neuroscience so this looked really cool to me. So I got the teacher training, so I teach classes. And so that's what brought me to mindfulness and, and uh, self-compassion, how it informs my psychotherapy practice. It's something I think a lot about because some people are really overt. In other words, they will have their clients, their patients do particular exercises and things like that. I do that once in a while, but most of the time it's an internal practice for me so that what the client is receiving is my mindfulness and my self-compassion. And compassion is now referred to in the research literature as transdiagnostic and omnidirectional. What the research shows is both for MBSR and MSC is that no matter what the diagnosis is, whether it's schizophrenia or adjustment disorder or whatever, that it will improve the situation, no matter what it is, and MSC also. And But the omnidirectional is really interesting because with compassion, the way it's talked about in the traditions, so the contemplative traditions, not only in Buddhism and Christianity and in uh, other traditions, that if I express compassion towards someone else, I am also receiving compassion. If I feel I need some compassion, I can receive it from somebody else. They also benefit. So, and the contemplative traditions talk about the core of our being as compassion. So if we're communicating core to core, there's a mutual enrichment. And so I really like that idea. Any therapist would tell you there's times in session where we're sitting with a client and going, God, I've got absolutely no idea what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> yeah, most therapists will tell you that. And those are really kind of golden moments. So the practice in mindfulness helped me to go, okay, no need to react. This is, there's not a problem here. It's just a blank spot. Right, right, right. Yeah. And... 
And then what I say is, how can I help this person? And all of a sudden, something comes to mind, or they say something that then you know, that I that I get a signal that that's something they need to talk about, or something, and then we go off in another direction. Right, Works every right, time. Right, yeah. And I find that people really respond. Carl Jung said, "It's amazing what we're capable of when we're certain that we're loved." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Whoever said it, I think they were spot on. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. And also, we go and move forward to Carl Rogers, who is really one of the. That was a huge shift in psychology, and he said the first thing to do is establish an atmosphere of positive, unconditional, unconditional positive regard, which is a, to me a definition of compassion. And he said we're not going to do anything to our clients, but we're going to help them do the work that they need to do. All of psychology at that point, my view, shifted to mo- uh, mobilizing a client's internal resources, helping them to build those internal resources, to find them, and to develop them. And we just, you know, it's like we're midwives in a, in a way. There's a natural process of healing going on already in each client they get stuck because there's a resentment or something they don't understand or that there's family patterns that are in the way that they don't see or something like that. There's obstacles. And so what we really do is help the client resolve those obstacles and find those resources, internal resources, and access them. And so mindfulness and uh, self-compassion have really helped me to refine that view and I've only had a couple of clients where it, they just weren't ready. And maybe it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about the relationship between mindfulness and compassion. We could do that. I have like a few thoughts on follow-up from things that you've already said. So I like, I like the few thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. One of them is going way back to one of your earlier comments sure. when, you, when you were discussing alcoholism and you, and you mentioned this understanding of kind of having a spiritual malady sort mm-hmm. of that, that gets sort of overlooked. And I'm mm-hmm. just wondering, how does that, what does that mean to you or what does that look like? Because it's, mm-hmm. it's a meaningful phrase on some level, but then it also feels like it slips through my fingers. What, what might that spiritual malady look like? How would one know if they had that? If there's any way to unpack that, that would, I think that might be helpful. I mean, I just sort of believed that for a long time and sort of, but then at one point I asked the same question, what the heck is a spiritual malady? You know, what does that look like? What are the symptoms or the signs of a spiritual malady? When we look at the contemplative traditions and they talk about uh, the human condition, they all talk about suffering. And suffering, though, is not an accurate word because, yeah, it's painful, but that's not really the problem. The problem is we're out of tune with reality, that something isn't right. And I don't know what it is, and I can't get to it. It's way deep down. It's driving me crazy. Now, some of the ways in which people that manifest in people is that they employ methods of addressing that spiritual malady in ways that don't work, like moving up the corporate ladder or being famous or making a lot of money or whatever it is for them. Some people have a you know this idea, if I get married and I have kids and I have this wonderful house, that that's great. But that doesn't really get it all either. There's something with each individual that is not satisfied or not at rest, that is disturbed, unrequited. I mean, I'm just going to use a lot of different terms because I don't know which one's the most accurate, but because even discontent comes pretty close. It's like an unmet, deep unmet need. Mm, I like unrequited feeling too. Be, that mm-hmm. That's evocative for me. You know, mm-hmm. that there's like some kind of a longing there that's not getting met somehow, that's not plugged in somehow to, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And the thing with addiction is that alcoholics, people with addiction issues cannot stand that feeling. It's intolerable. 
So they're very sensitive to that discontent, that longing. And the only thing that even comes close to quieting that longing is the drug or the chocolate cake or gambling or whatever it may be. But it's fleeting. So it's not really a cure. And people wonder, well, why does somebody drink? Why do they continue to take drugs? Why do that? Why don't they just not eat that, you know, extra piece of pie or whatever it may be? And the question is, is because they don't feel good. And the best thing that they can do is do whatever they're doing. Now, one of the illustrations of this, there was a research study I read where young college age women who had disordered eating, they weren't eating disorders per se, but they had problematic eating patterns. And they invited them in, they were placed in two, there was a group A and group B, and they told them that what they wanted them to do, the study was for them to fill out this questionnaire. Well, the questionnaire was bogus, they just wanted them in the room. And so in both rooms, both A and B, when they came in, there was a large bunch of cake, candy, cookies, <laughs> pastries, yeah. and so prime problem eating a temptation stuff. sort of <laughs> right, exactly. table same plate in, in both groups but in group a the researcher came in and said oh who put this stuff here that stuff is so awful it's so bad for you i can't believe you know people can't i just can't believe people even eat that stuff it's just terrible total shame right mm, shame inducing mm-hmm. group b the research the researcher comes in and goes Oh, I don't know. Who put this in here? Just, you know, you can have some if you want, but don't worry about it. I mean, every, a little bit now and again doesn't hurt anybody. You know, people make too big stuff of that. So the question is, who ate more or less of the stuff? Oh, my gosh. I think probably the people who felt the shame because they then they were trying to wow. make themselves feel better. Wow. Exactly. Oh. That's exactly right. Mm. Mm. So that to me, that's the epitome of addiction because addictions is entirely shame-based, entirely shame-based. And that's why people drink and do drugs and go gambling and do whatever they do. The shame, feeling of shame is intolerable. Now, when I started researching shame, I found some 20-year studies where they followed shame-based versus guilt-based people and followed them for 20 years. Probably here would be good to mention the difference between guilt and shame. Yeah, because guilt be is actually guilt means a clear conscience. Their conscience is working well. When you experience healthy guilt, you're saying it's it's sort of your conscience is doing its job. Yeah, exactly. Because our conscience gets all messed up with enmeshment and uh, resentment toward oneself, resentment to others or a sense of uh, deep sense of failure or incompetence or things like that. It gets all codependence it gets all messed up in there so when somebody has a clear conscience a well-functioning conscience what happens is, 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 is say they make a mistake they go oh man i can't i can't believe i forgot her birthday or whatever it is and so then they spring right into action they give them a call or they get in touch with them right away and say look man i really screwed up you know, and I really care for our relationship. So will he just tell me what I can do, you know, because let's get together or whatever. I'm, I'm so sorry. Make amends. They make amends. Now, you notice in that there is no question of the person's character. They are not questioning their character. I'm not the kind of person who forgets their friend's birthdays. But I did. I messed up. Now, a shame-based responding is oh god i forgot their birthday i can't believe it they're going to hate me i don't know what the i'm such an idiot you know there's all this self-deprecation going on and character assassination going on and what comes out is excuses there's like no accountability with shame wow mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly and so they say you know i can't believe i was busy and i this happened and you know, geez, I can't, this happened, that happened. It's like, please don't hate me. That's what comes out. And shame actually degrades the relationships and guilt-based responding actually enriches the relationships. So, and it's the same thing with couples I work with all the time is that 
one of the first things we talk about is the value of conflict in the relationship, how important it is. And not the kind of conflict where they're yelling at each other, not that, that's, that's not productive at all. But when something comes up that they have to negotiate, that's a really golden opportunity, it's a golden opportunity to grow the relationship. They're both guilt, guilt-based responding. They both can see their part, see the other part, extend compassion, that sort of thing. And it becomes a great way to grow the relationship. And it's really the kind of engine that drives the relationship. So when we talk about addiction, most people don't talk about shame. And we take a look at uh, 12-step programs and recovery programs. They didn't have the term, the word shame at the time. Mm -hmm. But it is a de-shame, they're de-shaming programs. It moves people from from a shame-based responding to life. I'm so terrible. I'm so awful. I did all this stuff. Uh, and making inventories and, you know, increasing one's faith and spiritual connection and going out and making amends and all this stuff that, that, that helps someone move into a guilt-based responding mode of life. And there's not a whole lot of that going around, actually. Taking responsibility. Taking responsibility. You know, if you've noticed in the news, one country will t- tell another, that's not right. And the other one said, well, you do it too. That's all shame-based responding. All shame-based responding. Being accountable is really what makes things flourish. You've mentioned a couple of times codependency. And I know that sometimes guilt can sort of run amok and my sense is that codependency is talked about quite a bit in recovery, talked about quite a bit in the world of personal development. It seems to get ignored a bit in sort of mainstream psychology and research. So maybe ways of working with guilt as it relates to codependency or just even healthy concern for others versus crossing that threshold into something that might be more problematic? Good question. From my view, codependence lay underappreciated. It plays much more of a role in, in, uh, in human life than, than we give it credit for. A few years ago, a colleague, we're in the same private practice, been in the same private practice for a while. She started doing a lot of work with narcissism. People who are, had been, uh, were in or had been in a relationship with somebody who's very narcissistic. And I started thinking, I started reviewing my clients, and I had probably 20% of my clients were trying to recover from a narcissistic relationship with either a, a partner or a family member. And the characteristic, the kind of sort of mindset that's drawn to somebody who's narcissistic mm-hmm. is somebody who's very codependent. Now, the term codependent was coined by Pia Melody. P-I-A is her first name. Oh, yeah. Codependent no more. Exactly. Yeah. And so anybody wants to know more about codependence, her work is just wonderful. Shannon and I both figured out that to help our clients recover from relationships who are narcissistic, we had to deal with codependence. Now, some of the characteristics of codependence that are active in this situation is number one, a diminished or not totally coherent sense of self. So the ego strength is low. They have enough understanding to be able to appreciate someone else's accomplishments, the narcissist, and think that they take care of the narcissist, they will be taken care of by the narcissist. It doesn't work that way. The narcissist has no interest in being caring or developing or nurturing whoever they're in contact with. I should say this too, is that narcissism is something that occurs along a scale. It's become more of a catchphrase these days and a lot of people don't really understand that. But if we go from zero, which is, which is like, you know, just a little self-centered or let's say one, just a little kind of, somebody's a little selfish, but, but, but not, yeah, but not too bad. Then you get more self selfish and then you get self-absorbed and then you get egocentric egocentric. And then you talk about narcissistic traits, and then you talk about narcissistic personality disorder, or deeply rooted in the personality. And then we go on to sociopathy and psychopathy. It's a continuum. 
that's the way I look at it as a continuum. That's very helpful, yeah. And, you know, we're all, you know, we've got self, selfishness going on here and there, and, you know, but, but it's not pathological. In mental health, there's a boundless personality, then there's a neurotic personality, and then there's a pathological problem. So neur- neuroticism is something in between 100% mental health, if there is such a thing. <laughs> right, the theoretical <laughs> construct. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and real mental, deep mental health issues, mm-hmm. right? So, which means that we're all a little bit neurotic at times. Right. You know, I might throw this in. The American Psychological Association every year has done a uh, stress in America survey. They want to rate how much stress people are experiencing and what effects they're having. And this is open. They're, they're wonderful to read. They do it every year. And the first one I read was 2017. And they said that the, it was the highest ever at that time. 65% of the nation was stressed. The thing that really impressed me about that particular survey was they also found out that 50% of the people that they researched had actually, because of their stress, had started volunteering or giving money or doing something Uh to try to make the world a better place, Mm -hmm. which I thought was really, that to me was the most important statistic. Yeah, That's something that is really the topic of the day because things are getting worse and worse and worse out there. The Center for Mindful Self-Compassion provides these free online uh, sessions with self-compassion teachers about 45 minutes. That's where Alex and I met, actually. And so I've been doing this for, I guess, a year and a half now. And the topic comes up over and over and over. How do I maintain stability when everything's so crazy? What do I do about my crazy mother or crazy father? What do I do about anxiety? And these are all questions that everybody's asking to one degree or another. Mindfulness and compassion are the perfect processes to be able to address these things yeah it goes along too with psychology moving into instead of a psychologist or psychiatrist and saying oh you've got this and you've got that and you've got this and you've got that to saying okay what are your strengths where do you want to go Mm. what is it that's holding you back and that sort of thing what we found out jen and i we have a workshop that we do with people recovering narcissistic relationships And that's really the question we ask, because first, somebody who's been in a narcissistic relationship, first thing they have to figure out is that they're not crazy. And this is how narcissism works. The playbook for narcissism is not that complicated, (laughs) right? They're just not that smart. If you understand what they're doing, you can out with them easily because hmm. it's just not that they're, they're not just not that smart. So we lay all of that out and all the tricks that narcissism play in order to undermine a person's will and their personality. Because when you do that, you can get them to do anything. Yeah. Right. And so once they, once they begin to understand that and then begin to understand they were predisposed, which is difficult for people to look at, how did I play a role in this? You know, it's all their fault. They're terrible. They're saying, okay, yes, they are. They got, they do this, that, and the other thing. But why were you there? Right. You had some vulnerability that let you kind of get sucked in and not set those limits. And yeah. Exactly. So it becomes a process of not only saying, oh, okay, what, is, what role did I play in this? What, what's the work that I need to do? And then begin to build that and say, okay, well, ooh, wow. Okay. Well, what kind of life do I want? And begin to be able to make those kind of decisions. And through mindfulness and self-compassion and the work that we do together, mindfulness and self-compassion are part of the program. We address those issues. So it's really a journey out from domination to self-actualization. Basically. Beautiful. Yeah. I want to make sure to circle back Oh, a little while ago, you were starting to talk about a study on shame and guilt over, I think it was 20 years. Yes. I'd love to hear the end of that. And we might have a listener who's like, but what about the study? <laughs> I'd love to hear the end of that story about the, that study. Yeah, I'm glad you came back to that because it was really a shock to me. What they found was 
is that the guilt-based responders were people who kind of had pretty much normal lives. They had good careers and stable relationships and families were good and their, their support system was excellent and they had a sense of direction in life and basic fairly high level of sense of well-being. Shame-based responding, addiction, sexual problems, relationship problems, employment problems, all kinds of problems. So virtually all of our social ills is from shame-based responding. So that's when I saw this is the issue. And perhaps, you know, you asked about what uh, spiritual malady is. I don't know for sure, but it sure looks like shame is the spiritual malady. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we get into the true self and false self. And that's a really important topic, too, because shame is all about this false self. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody said, I just think I'm worthless. Well, nobody's worthless. But so that's a false concept of self. All the contemplative traditions talk about this true self and false self. And the spiritual practices, wisdom and compassion, mindfulness and self-compassion, are to brush away and deconstruct this false sense of self that we have Mm -hmm. to allow the true sense of self to basically emerge Mm -hmm. wow you know there's a friend of mine who says you know i just don't think right and he's a very funny guy and but i think about that because when i talk to people sometimes i'm going like wow i just like can't even make sense about their for their mindset is so distorted and one of the definitions of sanity is soundness of mind And shame is not soundness of mind. So what we're talking about with mindfulness and compassion is the establishment of soundness of mind, because the mindfulness helps us get in touch with our basic nature, our true nature. And that begins to inform our self-image, and that begins to reach out into all of our relationships and our purpose and meaning in life and rather than trying to focus on the self the split between a true self and the false of creating this false self started with in our culture with edward bernays in the early 1900s he was for his nephew he was a master at influencing large groups of people to do things He worked with the War Department in World War I in the Propaganda Department, did very well there. And when the war was over, he said, well, uh, what am I going to do? I can't call it propaganda. Uh, What am I going to call what I do? And he said, "Mm, how about public relations? Okay, public relations. So he founded the field of public relations. The principles are the same. To me, the most telling example is where he... R.J. Reynolds came to him and was saying, well, look, we're missing out on 50% of the population. Women don't smoke. What can you do? So what he did was he got these sexy women, flapper gals, to dress up really snappy and walk in a line across the street in the Macy's Day Parade. And they hid their cigarettes, like in their stockings or in their bra or something. So on cue... At the right time, when the cameras were there, he had them pull out their cigarettes, and they called it the Torch of Liberty. Ouch. Torch of Liberty. Torch of Liberty. Oof. That's terrific market. Well, how many millions of women have died of lung cancer since that time, right? So, but he knew, he knew how to do that stuff. The shame self is always calculating our own self with that of others. So it's an outward facing, it's also comparison, how do I stand to this person and that person here and my boss and and this, you know, uh, am I a good person or a bad person or am I a good dad or am I a bad dad? And that's exactly what he established. The way to communicate and the way to find yourself, your own character is through products how you dress, how you behave, what kind of car you drive. And so there's this huge split between 
well, shame responding and, and uh, guilt-based responding. It wasn't about utility anymore. It was about lifestyle. Right. So that's one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in today is because a lot of people, their self-concept is based on how they feel others see them. So anyway, I thought I'd throw that in. But very, no, very thank important. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. Yeah. You were starting to say the link between mindfulness and self-compassion or compassion. One of the things I want to mention, particularly about mindfulness and compassion, is that these practices have been around ever since there's been religion, religious discipline. They've been central issues. And typically, mindfulness is taught first in order to develop a um, steadiness of mind and clarity of mind and develop a sense of equanimity so that we're not always in reaction to our environment, internal or external environment, so that we can develop a steady mind. And it's considered to be the source of wisdom. And somewhere along the development of mindfulness comes the work with compassion. And on some traditions, like the Buddhist tradition, they're taught one and the same. You have to have compassion, you have to have wisdom. So meditate and develop this desire to help other people at the same time. And Thich Nhat Hanh was one of the finest examples of a complete union of wisdom and compassion. He was just absolutely. And so how they inform each other is, is that we have the two different parts of the nervous system. You have the fight, flight, or freeze, and then you have the nurture and uh, the rest and digest system. And if we're in level of stress, Compassion is unattainable because we're in a survival mode. We're defensive and we're very self-centered in a very real sense where our individual safety is at stake. That has to be calmed down first. The problem with stress states is that it shuts down our cortex, the neocortex, our abstract reasoning. So the more we have, the less options we can generate. And the less options we generate, the more stress we get, stressful we'll get, stressed out we get, and then the less options we have. And so what happens particularly with suicide is people run out of options and say, oh, there's no more option. And so that has to be dealt with first so that we bring the nervous system down and start bringing it into balance. So to make it possible, compassion and connection and apply that wisdom to caring for oneself and others and to bring that into balance. The mindful self-compassion practices acknowledge that, and Kristen Neff has said that one of the three components of self-compassion is mindfulness. And what I found in the courses is that the people who have had more meditation time, it's easier for them to work with, the, with compassion. Mindfulness also helps us to develop a sense of distress tolerance, that when emotions come up, we realize we don't have to react right now. Mm -hmm. And it gives us the ability to deal with it. And working with compassion, sometimes we need that. You know, somebody gives us some really bad news, something that's really terrible that's happened to them. Mm -hmm. we, so that we don't go into, oh my God, that's terrible, and we go back into ourselves, And we, right. get, we get stressed out. We can stay open. Wow. and work with them compassionately hmm. so there's a lot more to it but that's kind of a short Wonderful. answer thank you they work. <laughs> yeah great insights thank you for sharing them you're welcome you're welcome and how can people learn more about you your work or study with you my website wishartcounseling.com and also i'm uh, on the board with the dallas center for mindfulness and compassion we're just great getting started and bringing mindfulness and compassion out into various organizations and people in the community. And it's just, we're just getting started, but it's really a wonderful Love it. project. That's great. Thank you. Sounds wonderful. Thanks so much, Alfie. This has been just such a deep dive and wonderful conversation. Really appreciate well, your thank insights. You. <laughs> oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been great. <laughs> Thanks for listening today. If you enjoyed this episode, we hope you'll hit subscribe, leave us a great rating or review, and spread the word. You can also go to noblemindpodcast.com to join our email list. 
you'll get a weekly behind-the-scenes message, news announcements, and other special goodies we come up with just for you. Thanks for listening, and bye for now.